Essentially, um, uh, prior to 1985, there was no law. It was simply um, crown prerogative. Elizabeth I, um, concerned about uh, Catholic plotters, Mary Queen of Scots and all that sort of thing, um, she arranged for letters to be uh, opened. Um, and you know, the history of interception and all of this actually goes back to the mail um, uh, before the telephone even came along. Um, the only point at which we started to regulate uh, or have law was um, under compulsion with the Interception of um, Communications Act, the Interception of Communication Act in 1984. That was based largely on the tapping of telephones, and um, uh, it made it illegal to intercept unless you were um, the Secretary of State, the Home Secretary, um, who gave the authorization. <coughs> and the other um, feature, which is important in the history of all of this, is that um, the result was going to be inadmissible in court. In other words, it could be used for intelligence purposes, couldn't be used as evidence, and you couldn't even refer to it in court. And that remains the position. Um, the other bit of historic um, uh, law which you need to know, um, um, it's still with us, but it's part of the history and understanding how the thing currently works, is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, and buried in that act, which was mostly concerned with uh, regulating how the police could handle us and our property and our premises physically, was the notion of a production order. Now, the idea of a production order is that a uh, senior police officer, not a judge, can go along to you and say, we think you have various sort of business records which we would like to have. And that was, um, at the time, considered to be primarily a means of saying, give it to us, otherwise we will come along and uh, carry out a full-scale raid. So that's an important element. Um, and um, that was, um, until 2000, the way in which um, information was obtained from the telephone companies. And that is admissible. In other words, it can be used and often is used in court. The other bit of law that you need to know about historically is the Data Protection Act. And in essence, if the police were going to send a production order to you for, say, telephone records, your telephone records were regarded as personal data, and they had to provide a certificate showing that under a particular exception of the Data Protection Act, uh, um, they were entitled to have it. In other words, they were investigating serious crime, and the other exceptions were national security and tax. And that's how things worked until 2000, when we had the regulation of the Investigatory Powers Act, which is the current uh, basic framework. And what that did was it updated the um, Interception of Communications Act definitions of what interception was. For the first time, it tried to define what communications data was, and it set out various types of procedures. But what was also happening in 2000 was that law enforcement was saying, you know, we have a problem. We're entitled to go along to the telephone companies, and obviously we were getting internet companies coming along by this time as well, um, that they are holding on to the information. We can only get the information that they're actually holding on to. They're not holding on to it for long enough. Companies were saying, well, Data Protection Act says we can only hold on to um, this sort of stuff for as long as we have a business purpose. After that, we have to delete it. So the first attempt was to try and um, extend that period at which material was being held. And that's what the essence of data retention. And the first attempt was done in 2001 with um, one of a very large number of anti-terrorism and uh, other matters acts which uh, we had. It's called the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act. And that attempted to um, extend this sort of period during which data was retained. And... Um, the current position is it's now done under another sort of um, easy to remember uh, bit of legislation, which is the um, data retention open brackets EC directive close brackets regulations of 2009. In other words, um, in fact, this was um, a policy introduced into the EU by the UK, but we then back-ended it into our own legislature. legislature. And essentially, this is what it looks like. This is actually the basis, the rules under which data is being retained now. Um, I'm not going to take you through um, all of the slides. Um, fixed telephony network, mobile telephony, internet access. I've got some slides which um, summarise all of these things. So the current position is... Um, if the police or the spooks suspect an identifiable person, someone they already know about, what are their powers? Well, in the first instance, they can get an intercept warrant from the Home Secretary, not a judge, a politician. 
and they can use that only for intelligence purposes, and that includes saving lives. And that's obviously material to what we think was going on at, uh, um, at Woolwich. Um, but the result is inadmissible, can't be used in court only for intelligence purposes. If you want communications data, um, you get it, in fact, by the current version of the production order, which is in with the within the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, sections 21 to section 25. Um, again, that's from a police officer, not from a senior judge, and the result is, is admissible and it's extremely useful. Um, and in addition for a live investigation, you can also get live movements via cell phone activity, and uh, get live use of ATMs, and uh, a number of other things um, as well. That's for the person you can identify. Don't forget that the argument in terms of um, data retention was, what happens if we discover a mature conspiracy <coughs> involving people we don't know about? What have they been doing in the recent past? So you can get historic communications data, again, via that method we were talking about just now. The data is currently retained for the whole of the population, for phone and internet users. And um, what's available is 12 months of records, phone calls made and received but not their content, regular emails sent and received but not their content, websites visited but only the top level, in other words, not what you did on the website, and mobile phone location data. And I think probably most people know that as long as your phone is switched on, it is not just while you're making an uh, actual phone call. So it's pretty powerful stuff, and a lot of people who, uh, during the debate on the communications data bill, um, seem to be talking mostly about powers which are already present. So what's currently not available, when a user goes onto a website and then communicates on from there, that's webmail and social media, um, uh, um, voice over internet protocol, the ability to talk in circumstances, it's the ability in some circumstances easy to link an IP address to a person, which is the bit that is still in the um, uh, legislative programme, and then access to information held by non-UK CSPs and where encryption is routinely used. Very quickly, what can you do about it? Um, first instance, you could try to redefine communications data, and the Home Office are thinking about that at the moment, haven't got a wording. Um, but there are practical problems of separating the communications data from the intercept. It was very easy with a telephone, much more difficult in terms of the internet. In terms of internet telephony, if you've got a UK-based service, most of them of course aren't, then you can demand that they have an intercept capability, um, and that's under Section 12 of uh, RIPA. Um, um, if you're dealing with a non-UK um, voice over internet protocol company, Skype, for example, you can't actually compel them. The UK uh, uh, legislature, um, politicians can't compel that. They either have to go via a mutual legal assistance treaty, which is slow, or by uh, having a series of voluntary arrangements. Um, if we look at the ability, in some circumstances, easily to link an IP address to a person, um, I'm going to gabble my way through this. The basic problem is um, the current system of internet addressing um, is um, inadequate for the number of people who want to communicate. There are a variety of fudges in order to obtain that. Um, there's no firm date in which the new version, which has more addresses, is going to be universal. So um, what the Home Office is trying to do is to work out um, how to get um, uh, how to overcome the various um, problems generated by the fudges used by CSPs. And they're doing that um, right now, and actually I'm part of that consultative process. Um, and there's a question about whether we need new law. That's the bit that's still in the legislative programme. Um, access where information is held by non-UK CSPs and where encryption is routinely used. This is where recent events in the news are coming to fruition. Um, again, you can go via the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, you can go for a voluntary agreement, and uh, maybe you can be using PRISM, as we heard about now. Um, uh, <coughs> In the case of a voluntary agreement, you have to understand the position of the UK. It's a supplicant. It can't actually force anybody to do anything. And um, I think we need to debate a little bit about what the terms are going to be that those external CSPs will impose on the UK in order to 
get access. Um, and the U fact that the UK uses politicians to authorise intercepts and police officers to get comms data is rather unfortunate. We may complacently say, OK, we're not bad at that in the UK. We're sort of vaguely satisfied with it. But there are many other countries where that sort of approach would be wholly unacceptable. So the problem really is, um, as the spooks say, we're going dark. How do you deal with non-UK CSPs who use encryption and won't cooperate? Um, and um, there are various sort of technical methods, but probably not universal ones. Um, the boots and the law, law enforcement will need targeted techniques. And the last thing I want to talk about, I'm sorry I'm taking one minute more than I am supposed to, um, this is the request filter, and the aim there is to be able to combine many different streams of digital data in the course of an investigation. And there are two interpretations of what that is about. All I'm doing is reporting, I'm not sort of giving my own views at this stage. Everything actually depends on the detailed definitions, oversight and implementation. What the Home Office is saying is this is currently a routine aspect of investigation. You bring together lots of different streams of evidence, different witnesses, different electronic streams, um, and you um, see, you try and bring all these sort of uh, imperfect separate items together and you reach a worthwhile conclusion. Standard detective technique. Um, what they want to do is centralise it uh, within the new National Crime Agency or adjacent to it and they say there are benefits in efficiency but also because you have fewer people involved and the poo people who are involved can apply tests of necessity and proportionality to the whole thing. Um, that's actually a good privacy um, intrusion, privacy enhancing, intrusion limiting exercise. What critics say is wide scale data mining. It all depends, ladies and gentlemen, on um, the precise wording. And that is the general difficulty with the whole legislation. Um, it's all very well for um, uh, politicians and former um, uh, specialist advisors, or uh, sorry, uh, independent advisors on terrorist legislation, members of Julian Huppert's uh, party, I'm afraid, um, saying, oh, we need to do this, um, but we want to have proper safeguards. Actually, the whole issue is about safeguards. Thank you. It was actually in 1920 that the first official secrets act, sorry, second official secrets act was passed, ostensibly to protect government secrets, but buried within it was we can go and get all international cables sent by that troublesome radio technique and which the government didn't know about. And that power and the use of that power, which persisted from 1920 to the current date in the new forms and the new forms that are being discussed in this bill, is as old as that. Uh, it was a secret power to get all international communications in and out of the United Kingdom. It nearly got exposed in the 1960s by a veteran investigative journalist called Chapman Pincher, but then it got buried. At about that time, responding to technology, a new system called Echelon was installed to secretly shadow the whole of the new form of international communications by satellite. Britain built its equivalent of the then post office terminal at Goonhilly at a place called Morwenstow in uh, Cornwall, which is now one of the major intercept sites for government communications headquarters. By 1974, it was revealed as a result of the Watergate hearings that NSA, responsible for big sister to the communications data bill, PRISM, that we've been hearing about, that NSA had been also systematically intercepting all international cables and telegraphs in and out of the United States under programs then designated Shamrock and Minaret. <coughs> Meanwhile, back in Britain, GCHQ was totally secret. No one knew about it. No one knew what it did. Uh, the idea of parliamentary accountability or even coming under the rule of law was totally absent until an irritating investigative journalist standing in front of you in Time Out magazine in 1976, did the first article saying what it was and what it was for. Look back at that article and you will find pitifully less information than GCHQ now publishes on its own websites and in many reports. But at the time, it was such a shock to the government that I and my uh, late colleague, Chris Penobly, uh, faced uh, prosecution for two years at the Old Bailey under the Official Secrets Act and uh, potentially, in my case, up to 30 years imprisonment. But we walked. That was the degree to which secrecy was the handmaiden of the lack of checks and balances on processes, which I would acknowledge, as everyone here would, 
are sometimes necessary. It's the secrecy that removes from civil society the checks and balances. In 1980, telephone tapping was conducted secretly down the road in Chelsea, out with UK law. There was simply no law. They just did it. They got on with it. And this was something that, again, I exposed in 1980. It led in a series of steps to actions in the European Court of Human Rights and thus produced what was the granddad of the current bill. If the 1920 Official Secrets Act was the great granddad of the communications uh, data bill, then this was the granddad, the Interception of Communications Act, which for the first time brought interception and the harvesting of communications data under the law. At that time, the communications data was typed out on little tape of electromechanical things, but it became fundamental. The Interception of Communications Act also more quietly, again, re-legalized the wholesale harvesting of the United Kingdom's international communications, so that if you communicated outside the United Kingdom, everything was taken. And that has continued right through to the 2000 Regulation, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. The way that the system of external warrants works is that a Secretary of State can issue certificates saying what kind of material you can take down. But it is the same system as we've seen exposed as working in the United States has been here and in use since 2000 in practical terms. It's been there before. Within a certificated warrant, the officials can write in their own targets. So the ministers don't even sign off on a warrant against a person so long as it fits an officially defined criteria within a certificate, within an external warrant to take all the communications. You're there, you're done. This was challenged as a result of an, another investigation, this time for Channel 4, where we found that a secret tower had been built in the north of England literally hoovering up all of the communications passing between Anglesey and the Republic of Ireland, which amounted at the time to all of them. Because in the meanwhile, the old IOCA had been replaced by the new Reaper, as is rather usual, the Home Office shrugged its shoulders and said, oh, we fixed it with this new law. It's all right. So what are the lessons of history? One, taking everything and throwing away proportionality, checks, balances, and accountability is not new. It's been wired into the British system, technically and politically, from the start. And the lack of these proper checks and balances for the protection of civil society is supported and <coughs> strengthened by total secrecy. That is why the work of oversight, challenge, journalists, members of parliament who give proper scrutiny, as Julian's, bill, uh, Julian's committee fantastically did, is so important. I offer you these lessons from history, folks. But let me start off by talking about the politics of this particular issue. And the context is really, really important, because a huge number of civil servants, a huge number of politicians, probably more politicians, don't really get the internet. In many cases, it's not malicious. It's a fact of not understanding it at all and what's possible. So the Digital Economy Act, which was, I think, the first reason I ever came uh, toward Con, um, you may know it's gone, no, it's gone rather quiet recently. That's not accidental, and I'm very pleased about that. But when that was being rammed through just before the elections, the minister talking about it talked about IP addresses as intellectual property addresses. <laughs> so that's not a great understanding. <laughs> I, I was on the defamation bill committee. One of the ideas that was floated there, <coughs> we should just require ISPs to have a little algorithm that just filtered out any defamatory comment as it went through the wires. <laughs> um, that's quite a tough algorithm to write, really. And so you have this fundamental problem that these are not malicious suggestions, in many cases. It's people don't get what happens. They don't understand what the network is. They don't understand what's going on. And that's part of the ground for the Communications Data Bill, where it's pushed by a few people who do know what they're trying to achieve, and there isn't much of a pushback from other people who get it. My involvement with the Communications Data Bill actually started one, I think it was a Monday evening, when I went up to my office to discover Charles Farr sat in it. And this was before Charles Farr appeared in public ever. I, I'd seen him before, but it, a bit of a surprise. Charles Farr is the Director of Security and Counter-Terror, and is in charge, basically, of the entire comms data bill and, and everything to do with it. Um, 
And the original idea was that this was a small tidying up piece of legislation. It wasn't even going to get its own bill. Until a year and a bit ago, just, until just before the Queen's speech, it was going to be part of the Crime and Courts Bill, which dealt with a whole range of other issues, and this would never have had prominence, because it would not have had much time for debate. And that's particularly true, because actually in the Crime and Courts Bill at the end came all of the Leveson stuff. So we would have been faced under that circumstance with trying to make a case to a public at a time where every newspaper was obsessed with Leveson. We would have tried. We would not have had a chance of getting there. And one of the key steps was actually before that when... Uh, Nick Clegg said, no, I'm not happy with this. I want to see a draft and actually look at it properly. Slightly remarkable, this idea of looking at things properly is revelation in government, but that's, that's how things are. And that led to the committee that happened, and uh, there are various people here who were involved in that in, in one way um, or another. It was the biggest piece of scrutiny that had ever been done by Parliament on any piece of legislation. Now, I went into that with my, my colleague Paul Strasburger, expecting that there would be a small minority of us who were arguing civil liberties cases against everybody else. We were ready to do a minority report. It turned out the bill was so rubbish, <laughs> the case so weak, that we had a unanimous report, which was also the most critical report ever done of a government bill. Um, now, the Home Office don't just take these criticisms. They went back to try to adjust the bill and say, of course we can suit everything that, that you want to do, uh, as long as we ignore the paragraphs that say it's all complete rubbish. Um, they really, really want it. I mean, I cannot understate, I cannot over-exaggerate just how much the Home Office or some bits of the Home Office want this bill. It obsesses Theresa May, Charles Farr and others. There are three things they want. One was this issue about IP addresses, which, which Peter touched on. That's slightly different. It's a sort of more of a technical thing. It can probably be done without legislation. Um, I should say it's not about connecting IP addresses to individuals. It's about connecting IP addresses to a device of course, is far easier. You'd still have to show that somebody had that phone at the time. But, um, but that's, a, that, that's one thing. The other two things they wanted, to me, are just unacceptable. Powers to say that the state can, can force uh, ISPs to keep track of every single website you ever go to, up to the first slash. Now, some of them may be innocuous. You go to the BBC website. But some of them may be uh, a depression advice site, an abortion counselling site, marriage guides. There's a huge amount of sensitive data there. And we all know that sensitive data does actually leak. It's not always safe once you've collected it. And the other one was to force ISPs here to keep information on what you do when you go to ISPs overseas. So Virgin would have to work out what you've done on Facebook and keep track of it all. An astonishing thing to do. Quite hard to do, actually. And defeated by encryption, all sorts of problems with it. But also, as a principle, very damaging around the rest of the world. So those were the three things. I and those, those two were the main bits. And... Huge internal rows because Nick, I have to say I, I had some role in this, uh, said no, not going to happen. The various other bits of, of, of the detailed saga, but that was what happened just before the Queen's speech, and that's why we didn't have any of that in the Queen's speech. The only little bit there was, uh, and I was quite proud of this, we managed to get the Queen to say internet protocol for the very first time ever. <laughs> And that's where we were. Now, this was a, a huge row. Theresa May, the Home Office, did not just accept this, did not just go away and say, oh, right, the Dems have said no, oh, well, we'll do something else then. They have kept fighting it at every single stage, and they're still putting out deeply inaccurate briefings in some cases. They're not taking it lying down. And then Woolwich happened. And Woolwich was a sickening, brutal murder. And what's not quite as sickening and not quite as brutal, definitely not as brutal, is the way that some people have leapt on it to try to say, oh, what we needed was this thing we already knew. It's amazing, while everyone was trying to work out what was going on, some people already knew that it was a communications data bill that would have fixed it. Impressive work, actually, to have that level of insight. Um, and, I, 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 you know, Peter referred to, to Alex Carlyle, who's a, a, a former Lib Dem MP, uh, now a peer. He certainly does not speak for the Lib Dems on any of this, uh, and is very much on his own against everybody else. But we've seen official calls from Labour for this. And Alan Johnson, who was the Home Secretary until the last election, has said live on TV that had Labour won the last election, they'd have gone ahead with it. And we know where the Tories are. And this isn't all of, all of both of those parties. There are people in Labour, there are people in the Conservatives who, who are on the right side of this. The official positions are clear, and they are pushing hard. We've heard comments from Labour that it should be a resignation issue for Theresa May if she doesn't get this bill. It should be a resignation issue if she does get the bill, frankly. Um, but it's not going to happen. As long as this coalition is there, we will not allow it to happen. No way will there be powers for the web uh, logs to be kept or powers for third-party data, the, the, the stuff for the overseas. Absolutely not happening. 
They, 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 they may try to come up with some sort of bizarre Labour-Tory alliance, but we'll try to make sure uh, that doesn't know. It's not going to happen in this Parliament, but I cannot make any guarantees about what happens in the next Parliament after 2015. I cannot give any certainty about that. I can do my best, but it will make a big difference. So we can hold the line for now, but we can't be sure then. I can't be sure that Lib Dems will be in government in 2015. If we're not there, we can vote against it, but we run the risk of losing. <coughs> so there are some things which you can do, and that's where I just want to finish. If you are a Lib Dem sympathiser in any way, please come and help. You know, that, that, that's one of the best things you can do to stop the communications data bill. If you're in another party, please try to get them to see sense. It really would be wonderful if one of the other parties, at least, could swing over to our side, the side that we all share. That would make life far easier. And then, even if you're not involved with a party, go and help put pressure on candidates when the elections come around for people who will stand up firm against this. Get to the people from Labour who oppose it, elected, rather than people from Labour who support it. Do the same thing with the Tories and make sure that we are held to our promises. We have to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, it's, it's quite funny how when you study law, you learn that the rule of law is actually one of the most important values in our society. And then when you start working, you realise that to the people in charge, it's actually not that important at all. Um, I think this is especially true when it comes to, to mass digital surveillance. Uh, for example, the New York Times called uh, President Obama, or said that President Obama has lost all his credibility on this issue. That's something that doesn't happen every day. So we, we developed this report. Um, I've seen some copies lying around. I don't have one myself, but it looks like this. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're, all, they're all over the place. Um, and this report we, we set up with some key experts on these issues, Peter Sommer, uh, Duncan Campbell over here, and eight others, who address uh, different aspects of uh, the CDB and mass digital surveillance in general. Um, at the end, we distilled ten recommendations, which I'll go through quickly. Um, and the, the aim really is to guide future discussions on this topic, because we feel, as uh, Julian Hopper has just said, that uh, the, the analysis of what's happening is not really um, what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking bro more broadly. Um, before, before I start talking about the 10 recommendations, I would quickly like to notice one thing that uh, was discussed by Joss Wright in this report, and it actually relates to the first uh, recommendation we have, which is from Peter Sommer, uh, to hold an overarching review, potentially through the Royal Commission, <laughs> to properly study surveillance in the digital age. Joss Wright mentioned that when making policy, equating the internet with historical technology is not just simply wrong, it's dangerously misleading. Because, he explains, limitations that existing technologies will disappear as technology develops and becomes more efficient. Uh, the development of information technologies such as the internet has expanded the potential for surveillance to a degree that would have seemed fantastical in previous decades. We can now collect, store, and analyze all the data we want, which was not possible with wiretapping telephones, for example. Um, the point really is that when you regulate information and information technologies, and these technologies uh, develop or become more efficient, the scope of these laws become or increases exponentially. Uh, and any extra powers, even if you add some little powers to the uh, technologies that we have, uh, they will also grow exponentially as technology develops. So what's most important is minimization, decentralization, accountability, and a limitation of access, which are all the things that the CDB would not have done. <coughs> um, so the, the, the first uh, idea of holding a... a, a proper study of surveillance in the digital age really comes down to the question of what do we actually want to do with surveillance? What, what's actually the aim? Because at the moment, people just uh, record everything. And I think, as Julian Hoppert said as well, and I've, I've worked in government myself as well, I think this is an effect of a, a, a lack of technical understanding by policymakers and by uh, politicians. Uh, for example, I've seen that some senior key officials don't actually know how to use email or haven't used torrent sites 
but they do regulate the hell out of them. So it's something to, to, to really be, be wary of when discussing these type of issues, that you don't go into too much technical detail uh, and really explain what it is actually that we should be doing with surveillance. The second point is um, what is needed is a good judicial oversight for uh, any traffic data requests. Um, Angela Patrick of Justice notes in the report that judicial scrutiny is the paramount means of protecting individual privacy in instances where the individual themselves may be unaware that their information is being handled. See, this, the, the balancing of privacy and law enforcement interests is qu quite a difficult ethical dilemma um, from a legal perspective or from a rule of law perspective. Uh, these decisions can be pretty tricky to make. So they, they shouldn't be left to the law enforcement officials, as it currently is, who will probably be working on the case or whose colleagues are working on the case and who they'll talk to over lunch. It needs to be handled by a qualified and impartial judge. For example, at the moment as well, you've got, we've all heard about PRISM. What is happening now is that there's absolutely no judicial oversight and no democratic oversight because the UK can actually outsource their uh, data requests to the NSA who have access to the databases of all the big internet companies and telecom companies. There's absolutely no oversight. So that's the second very important thing. The third one is we need to reject vague proposals. Um, this comes back to my point earlier where uh, the, any vague proposals on developing technology will just increase the scope of that. Uh, of the powers. Uh, so we, we see you, you have this, my, my colleague um, John Laprise calls it an illegal space where uh, technology develops quickly, uh, law process is quite slow. So you have this space in between where there's a, a con confusion about the capacity of new technologies, uh, which leaves the government to freely interpret the rules that are regulating those technologies. Uh, and, you know, with scaremongering about you know, terrorism and pedophiles, and we've heard it all recently, ultimately gives the government much greater power. So it's a, keeping uh, legislation vague is a, a trick to increase your power, basically. So what we need is we need uh, legislation when, or, uh, that also raises powers are prescribed by law, that they're strictly and demonstrably necessary to achieve a legitimate aim and adhere to the principle of pr proportionality. It should be clear, clearly written, that everyone understands what it actually means, which isn't the case at the moment. Uh, then we have a few other, uh, about seven other important recommendations. I'll go through more quickly in the interest of time. Casper um, Bowden noticed, for example, that we should be uh, d doing data preservation rather than blank blanket data retention. And this is because uh, data retention looks at, at all communications and stores it all in a server and then allows people to just, or law enforcement to uh, troll through it, analyze and pick out whatever they want. But what we really need is targeted uh, surveillance and find the real threats to society instead of making everyone, or treating everyone like a criminal. Uh, Simone Halink and some, a few others the Dutch uh, NGO Bits of Freedom noticed that uh, individuals should be notified if their data has been accessed. Um, another important one is that uh, in reviewing the, all these uh, mass data, digital surveillance laws, we should invest in the capacity of law enforcement to analyze uh, the capacity they have at the moment. Because, for example, uh, it was said by MI5 that Woolwich would not have been prevented by, uh, by the CDB. There's a lot <coughs> to do. I think I have to stop now. So quickly, the other ones, we need to lift uh, the ban on the use of intercept evidence in court, which is a strange anomaly in English law. Uh, further, <coughs> we should have a look at what um, civil society organizations are actually doing at the moment. You've got Privacy International with some others. They've developed the website www.necessaryandproportionate.net where they've actually thought about the future of digital surveillance laws. We need to provide stringent penalties for the misuse of powers uh, or data. Uh, that would be quite handy now seeing what the NSA and the GCHQ have been up to. Uh, and finally, last but not least, uh, we need to create a unified surveillance commissioner 
who's capable of carrying out strong and independent audit instead of the spread out and vague uh, setup that the UK has at the moment. Thank you.